Welcome to Herbally Yours, an adventure into the world of natural medicine. Here is your host, Dr. Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse who will help you take the leap to ultimate wellness. And greetings. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse, and we are so excited to be here in the studios right here at 90.3 WHPC. And we're bringing you today a live version of Herbally Yours right here. And with me, we're so happy to have as our guest, Mr. Jaime Espinosa. He's over there. And I'm not sure how the, the cameras are going, but you can look into your camera, Jaime. And we're going to be talking about a lot of things right here today on Herbally Yours. And one of the things we'll be talking about is a book that Mr. Espinosa wrote, which is actually translated into English and Spanish, and it's called The Wish to Live. This is what it looks like. I actually actually grabbed one uh, online in a Kindle version, and I was telling Jaime that for me that was easier to read because then you can make the letters, you know, very, very big. But he has this as a hard copy book, easy to get online, and also in Spanish for those of you who are Spanish readers. So I was really fascinated because he and I met each other through work, uh, some projects that we were working on, and then through a conversation, I was telling him about Herbally Yours and our work with natural medicine. And he shared with me that he has a beautiful retreat center, which is called Costa Rica Enchanted Paradise.com, which we will have on our archives. So you can just click the link and visit it. And that was something that I thought was really interesting because he had a, a lot of knowledge about herbal remedies from his grandmother, as I was taught herbal remedies from my grandmother. So I'll tell you a little bit more about Jaime Espinosa. In his book called The Wish to Live, he describes the political upheaval that led to him being incarcerated in a concentration camp for two years. And now he has lived in the, the U.S. for at least 35 years. But where, what happened there was a political unrest situation dealing with um, Salvador Allende in Chile. So it goes back to the early 1970s and, and is really quite a story, which he shares in his book, The Wish to Live. And then we went on to talk a little bit about plants. So we'll start our conversation there. If you were to go and visit Costa Rica Enchanted Paradise, or if you wanted to go there for a vacation, or how about groups? Could groups come there, you know, and, and do like a yogurt retreat? It looks to me perfect for that. Yes, we can uh, actually uh, hold about 22 or 24 people. Because you had uh, places to sleep, and then pl beautiful fishing expeditions, and <laughs> <laughs> Barbecues. Yes, we will never let the kid people get bored. Um, yes, we're trying to accommodate, and uh, I tell you what, but for me, in the island, we got air condition, which is rare. I mean, we work very hard uh, for anybody who want to come to visit us to have the greatest time, good memories. And this is on an island off the coast of Costa Rica. Yes, it's uh, it's only ten minutes from where the ferry land. Uh, then I pick, I pick everybody up, I give them the transportation, and uh, they'll be in paradise. I mean, total disconnect from civilization, uh, free from a smoke, everything natural. And so, there's no internet, I imagine. Uh, yes, I did. I managed to get internet. There is internet. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. better for Western travelers who like can't imagine turning off internet totally so they can check in with their families. And the name of that place, again, is Costa Rica Enchanted Paradise. What inspired you to give it that name? Uh, the reason why I, I, I got to the place and, and I looked at it and uh, I says. You know, it, it was hidden, um, and and I got enchanted. <laughs> so, uh, and I also, I, I asked, you know, God, I never ask you for anything. I said, but this time I'm going to bother you. I said, I, wa I want to buy this. I want, I need to have the, this piece of paradise. And uh, that's what I did. I mean, uh, little by little, with a lot of work and creativity, uh, we managed to do it. 
And you built beautiful buildings and walkways. You know, it's a perfect place for somebody to host. You know, people do, if we get back to it now, post-COVID, if, we, if people get back to like a travel wedding or a travel, you know, party of some kind, it's the perfect location. Yeah, uh, plants uh, in uh, fruit trees, like especially guanabanas, uh, plantain, uh, all kinds of uh, banana trees, uh, lemon, oranges, uh, uh, avocados, all that. I mean, uh, since you mentioned early, my grandmother, she always uh, put it in my mind, you know, the, the right way to be is trying to get in contact with nature, trying to find uh, the remedy or whatever, you know, uh, affect your body. I said, find it. And that's what I did. You, she used to ask me when I was a kid, where does it hurt? And I used to point at her. You see, and then she used to go to the garden and get this herb, put uh, had water, and later on, you know what? It was like a miracle. It was my faith. That was my grandma. And, and that stays with me for the longest time. It's true. And many people started in herbal medicine that way by some of their relatives. In fact, if any of you reach back in time and speak to your grandmother or if you have an elderly aunt or uncle, ask them, what was the home remedy that was used? Because you'd be amazed if you then look it up, even on PubMed. So many of these things have now been documented to where we understand on a molecular level the mechanism of, a of action. So it wasn't only your faith, but it actually works. And now mm -hmm. we know why it works. And some of the plants that you have right there at Costa Rica Enchanted Paradise include noni, Right. which noni juice is for sale for like $50 a bottle, but meanwhile it grows wild in warmer locations. Um, you said all different kinds of mint and guanabana. Let's talk about that because not everybody is familiar with guanabana, but the leaves are useful instead of the, in, in addition to the fruit. Right. Uh, I've been, uh, since I started reading about guanabana and I gave me, it was a, uh, fight cancer and prevent you from cancer and uh, you know what I, just, I, I got so involved and uh, I got 43 uh, small ones which now and that was about uh, 8, 10 years ago and so now I get uh, so much fruit and early in the morning sometimes I go and, and check them out because they grow big big as a melon and uh, I just I get to know when they get very shiny they're ready to to ripe, you know, to get ready. So I make juice, and also I make tea, like you mentioned before, uh, out of the guanabana leaves. And and the active constituents are being studied more and more. When you said something about they can be have they have a high antioxidant value, which often protects the cell membrane from the attack of free radicals, which causes carcinogenic changes. So we actually understand the mechanism of how it can protect someone from developing all kinds of illnesses. So that's so exciting because it's something that your grandmother used, and now you're growing it, and then there's scientific data to support it. Right. And another one that you have there is a lot of different mint. What do you do with the mint trees? Or mm. they're not trees, they're plants. Yeah, they are they're, they're, it's a small plant. Some of them, they grow bigger, uh, like the one that is like in a brown stem and uh, kind of uh, a pepper, kind of peppermint. And the other one, they are a big round leaf, the light green. Uh, but they, uh, I drink them with honey. And uh, sometimes I put even cinnamon and, and become a great, something I feel so good because I, I can feel... The, uh, after a day or two, I feel like my body, it just, uh, I got a nice breath, not, not bad, breathy. I mean, it's, uh, it's clean in my system. It does. And we know that about mints. So I'd like to remind you, listeners, thank you so much for joining us today right here on Herbal Yours, right here on 90.3 WHPC. And you're listening to Herbal Yours right here on The Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse. And today, our guest is... Mr. Jaime Espinosa. 
And he's been talking about his natural healing center called Costa Rica Enchanted Paradise.com, where you can actually physically go. You can find it online first. If you're getting back on track with traveling again, it's a place to consider. But we also want to talk about going back in time with Jaime, something that is not the most comfortable thing, but obviously um, it propelled him to write his early life story, which is called A Wish to Live. So let's now talk about the book, because what inspired you to, to go into great depth? It's, it's really in depth. It's hundreds of pages. Um, it's all laid out in chapters. You have lots of pictures in here as well. And what happened to you as a young man that led you to write this book? Uh it was something in me, memories um, that make me remember, and it was painful memories. There's some time we are, as um, human, we're trying to create like a concrete wall because it's, it's so painful, right? I had so many nightmares my first five years, uh, but I didn't know how to write. And I had a friend, Edgar Vandenberg, he had already wrote seven books about economy, and I asked him, he says, I can help you. He says, just write me something, make tape recorder, give me something to write on it. So he did. And when he presented that book and I read it, I said, Edgar, this is not me. You're a professor, you're a teacher. So I'm a regular guy. So I had to find a way to start writing this book. And I start with two fingers, I remember. And then I, I incorporate two more. So I was four fingers. You know, next thing you know, I found something that I was relieving myself because in some occasion I cry. Some other one that I start laughing. It's my human history because I had it unburied things that, that was so painful. So I had to learn to remember everything. Well, we have to go back and let our listeners know what the story is about. So basically, this has to do with a political event that was going on, actually, at the time in Chile when you were a young man, and Salvador Allende became president. So let's start there. And where were you at that time? Yeah, I was uh, a sailor. And uh, everybody was talking about that maybe we was going to, the military was going to take over the government. So there, were, they were, there was talk of a coup. Yes. A military coup. Hmm, that's interesting. We've heard that before recently here. Okay, so that was at that time in that country. Yeah. He was president already, and there was talk of him now taking over the whole government with the military. Right. So n now, uh, since we, between the old and Navy personnel, we start talking about so what's going to happen. Well, it, let me just ask you one other thing. Why did you join the Navy? Uh, after my mother passed away when I was 16 years old, uh, we were poor in, in a small town, and I had no money to pay for an education. I figured that was, before my mother passed away, I figured that was the, the best way for me to get an education. And instead of being stuck there, you know, so, and that's what I did. So uh, I followed, that was how decision. And um, then go, going back to the idea to kill each, each other, to have a civil war. I mean, that, that really, I says, I'm not going to show nobody. So the war that they were talking about having was going to involve... Uh, let's say the government against certain citizens that did not want this coup to happen. So then they were going to use the military, including you as Navy personnel, to actually kill other Chileans. Right. And uh, I got, I got uh, arrested to almost two months before this happened, and they had me incarcerated. And they had incarcerated some other people that they opposed to this kind of movement. And so it was a political prisoner right. for opposing the government. They started interrogating me. They accused me as a communist. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not a communist. I was a young kid. I had no idea about politics. But they, they started beating me up, torture, and, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, that I I didn't know. I mean, that I that I can, I, I, I was going through this kind of experience that is so painful, paying for something that I never want to harm anybody. 
So you didn't like the idea of them telling you, oh, and you're going to go and, you know, we're going to force the people to take on this whatever new government right. program. And that's great. That's that's exactly what happened. You know, uh, going through Ellen, uh, all these sailors, which uh, we call them marinos constitucionalistas, uh, we all went through hell and come back. I saw that so many times. They had me from uh, the shooting squad. Uh, where they had you in front of a shooting squad? Yeah. But they, obviously they didn't say shoot because you're sitting here now many and, years later. They, they, and, you know, I, <laughs> um, there, were, there were three soldiers, a lieutenant, and they were keep interrogating me, ta- asking me to give them names. Give them name, one name. I said, yeah, tell me where your followers, where's the, all the communists, where's... I says, I told you guys the truth. He says, well, he says, look, if you want to die... You're going to die. Look at those rifles. they aiming at you. And, and I says, but I told you the truth. And he says, okay, that's, that's your life. And he goes, fire. And I heard the guns. The guns went off. I closed my eyes. I says, God, forgive me. And I feel, I, I don't know why I wasn't falling down. But that's, that's what happened. Ellen. I mean, that, that I still got a mess with that. So you don't know if he told them to just use blanks, like to they scare were using blank, just yes. to scare everybody. Yeah, well, it does, I don't know. I mean, I, I I didn't want to talk about two or three days. My my friend that was asking me, "How are you doing?" I mean, I how can I say something one day? The guy says, "If we ever tell someone what happened," he said, "Then we're going to make the real thing." So I know th- during that time you have some great pictures in here too. Um, you as a young soul, a young, I don't know if you call it a soldier, sailor. That's this is a beautiful 17 picture. years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Where did you ever find these? And then you have also pictures of a lot of, unfortunately, the various kinds of jails that you were uh, incarcerated in, such as uh, one that was, I guess, famous, Valparaiso. Valparaiso, yeah. yes. Uh, they, they had us uh, up in a mountain. They, they call them the Llanos of Coyuay. That's uh, some kind of flat land all the way on top of the mountain. And that's where they, they had us build the concentration camp. They had uh, two fence, right, with a minefield in between, with the towels where they used to watch over us. And um, eh, it's hard, it's hard going back to remember but you have how did you d- dig up all these pictures of these places are they uh, in a museum somewhere because I know you have a picture of that place and also of Risk Island yeah. what was the difference between Risk Island and Valpai R- Risk Island one of the guys there he was a, a painter and he actually drew exactly how how the um, the concentration camp was and after he did it with a, with a pencil, and then uh, we, he became free, and then he did something better, and that's the case he gave it to us. And you have other pictures in here, just like the bathroom and the living, you know, conditions. And that, that's me, that picture they show right there. And uh, right there, we were all going to get shoot. This one? Shot, yes. Uh, they had about 50 Marines that came inside the jail that was in Valparaiso. And um, all, all of us, we was going to get shot. The, the uh, captain from the jail, he says, if they're under my jurisdiction, he says, you're not going to shoot nobody. Uh, <laughs> so, so It's th- rough. It was like a cathartic exercise for you yeah. to write this book and tell people. Now, th- it's, it's kind of a similar story when we go back in time to other people who have suffered this kind of... Uh, government takeover of their lives and fought against it, you know, very often. So you're over here. Are you talking, is this Nogales? Is that Nogales, Mexico? Uh, no. There, there's also a Nogales yes. in Chile as there's well. In I Chile, didn't know yeah. That. That, that was uh, uh, after the, the uh, International Red Cross, the, they were there, they came to visit us. And uh, that the funny part is when they came to visit us, they gave us like a quarter chicken, mashed potatoes, salad. And right after they left, we went back the next day to the boiled beans. <laughs> we, will, we will say, please hang out for only two days. That way we can have a decent meal. 
So that was a very treacherous occurrence in your life. And what is this bo- this boat on the back of the boat? Because I know boating is also a very important part of your yeah, life. Yeah, that's, that's the tall ship from uh, Chile called Esmeralda that goes around the world, you know. And then you got a lucky break also, because in here you have an entire story after you got out. How did you get out of the prison, finally? Uh, And alive, no less. Yeah, that was uh, my father. My father uh, went to uh, the Fiscalia Militar, that's where all the command is, and uh, he threatened that he was going to blow himself up, and he didn't release me. And... uh, he said that I, after that, the secretary, he, he called me. He says, you have to love your father very much. He says, uh, he said he was going to shoot himself in front of us if we don't uh, let you free. Wow, that's a wild story. And I want to tell our listeners that you're listening here to Herbally Yours on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse. And today, our guest right here in the studio with us is author Jaime Espinosa. And we're talking about his book, The Wish to Live, in which he talks about a treacherous story that caused him to have very severe PTSD, which, of course, was not really diagnosed, correct? Nobody came and did a psychological analysis and said, oh, you need help because you have PTSD. Yeah. So. No, this uh, came uh, years later uh, when I visited a psychologist, and uh, uh, she noticed, he said, there's something, uh, it was inside of me because I got beat up when I was handcuffed. I was all tied up. And then he says, now that you got uh, your, your, your limbs free, your hands and everything, something that, that it offend you or, or hurt you, then you're ready to attack. You know, and uh, it took me a while before uh, I feel relief. Like I said in the very beginning, I, every time I, I, I remember these painful memories, I, it was, uh, I create like a concrete wall. Writing a book for me, it was like a relief. It was, it's, it's like the vomit from my soul that I had to remember and put everything I'm writing. And I cry so much. And at the same time, sometimes I laugh. And, uh, but it just helped me a lot. And I know that you shared with me that now, then you came to the United States. You've lived here for 35 years. And that was a fascinating story in and of itself. That you were brought here and actually very, very successful, and you're a United States citizen at this point. Yes, yes. No, I mean, the, this was great because I found uh, that was like a committee that was helping uh, people who, like me, that there was a torture beat up. We had no future in Chile. And um, they, uh, they took all my, uh, my information and they said they go back home. And they gave me a month or two. He said they were going to get back on me. And then they sent me a letter that I was a free man to go over their office. And Ellen, when I got into their office, and he said, you've been accepted. And they showed me the, the world map. He says, where you want to go? We're going to help you to start a new life. My heart was pounding so I couldn't help but All the tears came out of my eyes. I said, you're not joking. I said, well, no, we will never joke about something like this. And you chose the United States? I chose the United States, New York. And here we are. Oh. <laughs> and you still love <laughs> Best boats. thing happened in my life. <laughs> that is, that's really a phenomenal story. And, you know, you're really talented. How did you get all your skills in terms of building so many things and building Costa Rica Enchanted Pad- Paradise? Uh, God gave me a talent. And I discovered that with the years. First, I started uh, uh, cleaning tables, uh, washing dishes, uh, like everybody, six months. And then after that, I changed uh, the job. I found a better job until I got uh, Fairchild Republic. I worked for an, an aircraft Oh, you company. worked in Fairchild? Yes. Right here on Long Island? Yeah, on Long Island, yes. I was there almost 10 years. And then in 1986, when they closed the door, they moved to Texas. Um, I decided to start my own company. Yes, um cutting grass, then uh, become a carpenter, a mason, and then guess guess what? I mean, I it was a world of construction in front of me. 
And I got involved, and I did it. I do that with passion. So that's a fantastic American story, you know. Thank that's, you. That's what we talk about in terms of, you know, the American dream, that if somebody has passion, even if they came from a very rough start, you did being incarcerated in a concentration camp and tortured and, um, you know, all of those things that happened, but then it balanced out with the offer to start a new life in the United States, which they didn't hand you everything, but we got you here, and then you took that opportunity and, and even went back in time more recently writing your book, The Wish to Live. I'm um, sort of as a catharsis, but it's a really interesting book. And I'll say it, it's fast moving when you read it. It's interesting. And a lot of it is personal. A lot of, you know, sexual stuff that went on just in your life as a young man and, right. and um, relationships that you had. You've also been a single father. And, and raised a, a beautiful daughter on your own as well as have other children. So a phenomenal story that you took the time to share with the world. It was really, really wonderful that, you know, you did that. And to end it off, you have Costa Rica Enchanted Paradise. So you both, you're, you know, you're kind of a snowbird like me, yeah. right? <laughs> you go to Costa Rica in the winter and you're still here on Long Island in the summer. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. And uh, yes, I have full, I kind of fulfill my dreams, and, uh, and there will be a message, you know, for for everybody. I mean, whoever have a dream, never stop. Just follow your dream, follow and, and determine, you know. And I really love what you shared with me earlier. Like, why don't we, as a race and even as a nation, really focus on how we can all live together? Instead of saying, well, our path is the right path and let's, you know, destroy everybody else, regardless of what side of things that you're on. Right, Why yeah. not look, what about the planet and the earth changes? And, right. You know, that's what's really important. Right. Why we have a school to create a new weapon, new way of destroying ourselves? Why don't we have a school to solve a human problem? I mean, that, that's my question, you know. So, but in any event, thank you, Ellen. Thank you, too. And thank you, listeners, for joining us once again right here on Herbally Yours on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse. You can find me at naturalnurse.com. And until next time, we hope that you stay healthy.